Uh, next up is uh, Jorge Cardoso, no. who's um, a lecturer at um, UCL, and he, Jorge has been working on a very interesting platform for doing deep learning on uh, medical images. So, yeah. Jorge, the floor anyway, is yours. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm, tr I'm going to try to do a short talk and then a very short demo just to show you what the kind of stuff that we're working on. Uh, but basically, I'm presenting a platform that we've been developing called NiftyNet. Um, so one of the problems that we found in the medical domain is that it's one of the few fields in imaging where um, there's a lot of field-specific knowledge. The kind of data we're working on is very different, uh, so standard packages do not have the functionality that is necessary. We work very often with 3D, 4D, 5D data sets. Things don't scale the same way. Data sets are quite enormous. The way you sample from data, the way you handle coordinate frames and how patients are oriented in scanners and things like that is very particular to the field. So we felt that the simple thing that most people do, that having a data loader connected to a standard um, TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, whatever your favorite is, just doesn't scale up. There's a lot of technology that is necessary, and everyone else that is working in the field is re-implementing the same tools over and over again, and they're not following the best practices in terms of implementing those and validating those appropriately. So we basically thought, Rather than having everyone reinventing the wheel, why, can't, why don't we just put everyone's effort together? Let's try to, to create a community tool where multiple universities can contribute to and everyone is basically implementing against an API. Uh, at the time that this started, uh, we kind of selected TensorFlow as, as, as the, the, the go-to platform. But basically, in the end, we wanted to have a platform that was able to handle all of the data that we, that, that we, that we might encounter, mostly imaging. So we're focusing mostly on medical images. Uh, we need to encode things like medical images, the pixels or the voxels in 3D. They're not really squares. They can be elongated. They can be anisotropic. Uh, and you need to handle that appropriately. So scale is quite complicated. Uh, you actually know about the resolutions of images. You know how big each pixel is. And that's super important. So there's many things that we had to include in the, in the software that we had to think from the ground up. Um, of course, we decided to go for something which is fully open source. Um, we wanted to have a very well validated and tested framework, so there is a very extensive continuous integration behind and all these things. Also, we have been working quite closely with NVIDIA to be able to scale it up to multiple GPUs so you can run it on large clusters. And the reason for it is because memory for us is extremely um, scarce. So batch size of one is very common in medical imaging because that's how much you can fit in a GPU. So you need to really scale up to multiple GPUs to be able to do something slightly smarter than that. And doing that in an efficient way is really not trivial. And if you're a maths person or a biomedical engineer person, you might not have the computer science skills to do that, and that really stifles your research. So what we decided to do was to uh, create this modular uh, system where that, that, that tries to encompass everything that you might possibly want to do in terms of a medical image experiment for research purposes. And we, would, we provide basic building blocks that of, of this full pipeline. And we also provide you a way for you to disseminate your research into uh, our own model zoo. There's even an evaluation framework, which is very, very comprehensive and runs very strong statistics, uh, compl complex evaluations on all the data that you have. And really, the idea of providing it this way was that if you want to do your PhD on new methods to do data augmentation, which in medical imaging, by the way, is extremely important, then you can do that, and you just rely on every other part of the framework to evolve naturally. Uh, and you can still contribute to the state of the art. Um, the architecture is a little bit complex, but basically what you have is kind of you have an I.O. model which knows how to load and unload the data. You know how to sample from data. You know how to handle geometry and how to ha handle orientations. Then the key part, obviously, is the network itself, which is that little part there that is within the red uh, square. Uh, and this, this network is defined uh, as a graph, and then there is an application driver that basically takes that and splits it in an optimal way through multiple GPUs on the, or basically or a cluster if you have one. Uh, and whatever the output of that is, could be an image, could be a classification or something like that, is then aggregated into an output stream, which is then pushed as an output data. And of course, you also want interfaces, for example, so that you can get data from uh, the picture archiving system of hospitals so that you can get data from standard databases that people use in the field. All of these things really are trying, we're trying to tackle all of those. One of the key things that we looked into was abstractions to make researchers' life easier. So we want this to be a research tool, but at the same time, we want it to become a general tool so you can do relatively simple tasks that everyone wants to do. 
if you want to do semantic segmentation of an object, you have a tumor in an image and you've asked your clinicians to contour many, many tumors, and you'd say, okay, now here's a new image, can you just give me the new tumor? That's a very, very classical task. So we created these applications, which basically define a series of elements that are key for that application. Defines the IO model, defines what kind of modalities, what kind of uh, networks are available, what kind of loss functions are available. And if you just want to do that relatively simple task, you can really constrain yourself to only using a configuration file that just turns things on and off. And I'm going to show you some of that in the, in the near future. But just to give you an example of what that means, for example, the example that I was giving in terms of semantic segmentation, um, if you're trying to segment this tumor, in reality what you have is your input is an image, your output is an image, so that's part of the definition of the I.O. component. In terms of loss functions, you have things that are specific to medical imaging, like dice scores and sensitivity specificity metrics, because you might want things to not miss uh, tumors. Um, then the way you sample can be made either just sample uniformly or can be made quite smart in terms of how the frequencies of different types of structures and diff different sizes of structures uh, contribute to the capacity and the nonlinearities that are encoded in your model. Uh, and of course, when you're doing inference on new data, you might actually want to know how uncertain you are about your boundaries, for example. You might not want to know the true segmentation because that doesn't exist, but you basically say this is where it should be, plus or minus a certain boundary which is encoded in the uncertainty. Or you might want to have a probabilistic outcome of that boundary. All of these things are essential in medical care because clinicians, what they say when they contour images, if you ask 10 clinicians to contour the same image, they will do it differently. So uncertainty is something that has to be there. And again, those things are trivial to implement, but you need to do it properly and you need to test it properly. So se semantic segmentation, for example, will be a application. Another one which is uh, quite common in other fields, uh, which is, for example, what you have when you have style transfer, uh, is to predict what one modality would look like from another modality. So in this case, we're predicting how a CT image would look like from an MR. And for some reason, they're cropped a little bit. But And what we're showing basically here is that the system is very similar to what I showed before, but rather than predicting a label, categorical label from an input image, you're predicting a continuous image from another input image. So this is similar to what people see in the mapping a horse to a zebra um, type of style transfer that you've seen. Um, we also created a model zoo interface and a protocol to do that so that you can basically take the models that you train and you can push them online. And it makes it really easy for other people to uh, use the models that you train. So you can, you can really start running NiftyNet with three lines of command where you basically just take pip install NiftyNet, you download the model with one single command, and then you just say run inference and you give it the file names and the configuration file, and that's it. So in three lines, you can basically have a full installation of the system and a working version that is actually solving your problem. And because the system actually knows how to handle the images appropriately, you do not need to pre-process the data in any way because it knows how to process the data to make it amenable for the network to use it to do its job. So since I've already spent eight minutes doing this, I'm just going very quickly. And there's a paper also describing infrastructure and things like that. So I'm going to try to do a quick demo, which never works, but let's see if it works this time. Uh, so there's a website. Um, the, there's a GitLab. The code is fully open source. You can join the consortium. You can become a developer and all these things. Uh, it's also on PyPy, so you can basically just do pip install NiftyNet. So I'm just going to SSH to my home machine, because my laptop doesn't actually have any proper GPU to do any of this. So that should be very quick. So if I just SSH to my home machine now, basically, uh, so NiftyNet is already installed, so I'm not going to go through there. Yeah, done. Almost. So net download uh, an isotropic um, an isotropic net sprats challenge model zoo. So that's just the name of the model. So you're just saying, please download this model uh, and put it into some folder. Uh, hopefully that will not take much time. So the idea. Increase the font size. Yeah, I can. I can do that. I can try, at least. Um, so when you do that, basically what it will do is it will pull several things. So when you define a, you need to define the application. You need to define. You actually push a file that just defines exactly the application itself, which is an extension of the main uh, of of the main base. And for some reason, my internet is not working on the other side. It never works. Anyway, the model is already pre-downloaded, so I'm just going to skip that part. Um, so it will download, it will create a folder um, under, 
nifty net. And then inside this, you're going to have different things. You're going to have extensions to the model. You're going to have some data, which is downloaded this part of the configuration file. Uh, and you're going to have the train model itself. Uh, you have a configuration file, which is going to be of this form, where you find multiple different input data sets of different types of images. I'm going to show you what that is. You also define the labels, which is the training uh, manually contoured images. You define things about how the network looks like, loss functions, and things like that. And at the end, you say that you want to run a segmentation problem. The outputs are some labels. You actually want to, let's say, you want to have uh, outputs probabilities equals, yeah, false is fine. So we want to output the categorical segmentation, for example, with two classes, label normalization equals false, that's it. So we just save that. So after we have the full configuration file, so I, we actually didn't change anything in the configuration file this time. The only thing that we do is we basically say, run inference, we give it the application name, and we give it the configuration file, and we say run it on CUDA. And that what it will do is it will, in that configuration file, is pointing to the locations of where all the files exist, uh, and what it's also going to do is it's going to load all the images, it's going to actually find out how many uh, modalities exist, if they match the model, if they don't match the model. It's going to find the sizes of all the images, so you see that this is the size of our image, so it's a 120 by 140 by 140 by 1 by 4 matrix, so it's a 5D image. Uh, and what it's going to do is going to partition this image in patches, and it's going to partition those patches in a way that is optimal depending on the amount of memory that your GPU has. So in this case, it's going to partition it in 27 different patches, but it's doing it in a way that it maximizes the amount of information that each patch has so that the solution is optimal. And so it's going to go through 27 iterations in this case, and after the 27 iterations, it's going to save the output segmentation. So let me just give it two more seconds. Yeah, so here it saves the file, so I'm going to cancel. So it's going to run on other files, but I'm going to cancel that. And I just remember that I connected, oh yeah, I needed to have X11 on, so I need to reconnect. Obviously, never type a password when you're doing a demo. Um, so the only thing now that I'm doing is, so he outputted that file, so now I'm loading a viewer, which again, I have the, files on my computer if the, if the connection is not fast enough. But basically what he's doing is he's loading a T1 image, which is one type of MRI. He's loading a T2 image and a flare image. So I'm going to now move it to, I need to minimize this so I can show you the image. Of course it never, is it not showing? Right, so it's still loading up. So what you see here is, um, let me remove the segmentation. It's going very slowly. But you see here in terms of data types that the algorithm has seen, he has seen a flare image, a T1 image, and a T2 image. And those are different physical properties of the human brain. And what you see at the top, you see three views, so there are just three different slices, but this is a full volume. And what you see in light blue is the area that was localized as a tumor. So this specifically is just for the demo, is only a two-class segmentation, so it's only separating the tumor and the edema from healthy tissue. But you could do the same thing with hundreds of classes. We have models that can scale up to 150, 160 classes. Uh, so this was a demo of, a very quick demo of what uh, inference part would look like. If you want to, for example, take exactly the same thing that we were doing, but just do a training on the same data set, uh, what you can do is to basically do something like this. So it's very similar to the net run inference, but now you do net run train. You can give it exactly the same configurations here, and what we're saying is, actually, we already trained 15,000 iterations, and we now want to continue training until 20,000 iterations. So you're just saying train 5,000 more iterations. So we're giving it the starting point. It could be a random one, obviously, but we're starting from a pre-trained model. And we can now feed in more data. You now have more data. You just feed in more data, you add more data, you, start, you say start from the model you have, keep training, and you're going to end up with a new model being saved, which is going to contain your updated training. Again, this is going to look very similar to what the one you had before, it's just that now is actually doing training rather than doing inference. It takes a little bit longer to set up because it does a lot of graph optimizations on the background, which is part of some of the things we've been working with Vidya. Um, so this is just an example for semantic segmentation. There's a lot more in the model to do. There's a lot more that the package itself can do. Uh, so if you, oh, nice. Hmm, I'll check that later. So yeah, the configuration file issue. Um, 
so, but there's a lot more than the software can do in terms of handling um, either semantic segmentations, uh, style transfer. There's three-dimensional and four-dimensional GANs and variational autoencoders and all these things that people are doing and that are really useful also in medical domain. Uh, but there's also things, slightly simpler things like classification tools, which we're now using to diagnose people and to improve the ways that we can predict how different diseases will evolve. Anyway, so that's all I have. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be very delighted to answer those. Thank you very much. Well, hey. Again, while we take questions, I'm going to invite the next speaker up. Uh, is Harry King? Yep. Yeah. Uh. Uh, I just have a, a, I don't know if you have an answer for it, but I was just wondering, it says any kinds of medical images that are more, provide better results with this, like uh, certain types of cancer, or, or is there some other type of images that are really hard to get a grasp on? The medical imaging world is moving quite quickly. So there is every year there is new modalities. There are slightly different things that you can do that make the diagnosis better. We need to, one of the key areas of research in the field is making algorithms robust to changes in the type of input data you're giving it, which is very similar to the problem uh, was discussed by the keynote speaker earlier today of how do you extrapolate to new unseen types of data, which is why augmentation is extremely important. So we need to have knowledge about MR physics and imaging physics to be able to augment changes that we know it will happen on the appearance of those images so that systems become robust to those. So all of these things are crucial if you want to develop real world working systems. So yes, it, it, you need to make the systems robust to those. Otherwise, in two years time, they will not work on the new data that is coming in.